just want to acknowledge that very uh, strong purpose here for us meeting at this time and in this place and this particular configuration. So I just want to acknowledge that that we meet this moment um, with uh, with with willingness and ability and understanding. So, you know, a little bit earlier, I was thinking about this question, what is historical trauma? <laughs> and and um, I think to, to talk about it, I, uh, you know, there's a personal aspect to historical trauma for me. I come from the Diné people and we um, were subjected to attempted genocide in uh, here in what is now known as the United States and in the Southwest. And, um, and so that's been a multi-generational um, disruption to our, to our humanity, <laughs> to our biology, to our psychology, to our spirituality, to so many things, you know? Um, and, and so I can, I can think about the, the specifics of what, what took place in that and how that has played out. Um, you know, you mentioned multi-generational. Multi and so in my family, part of that looked like, um, you know, our people being taken into captivity and put in a concentration camp. And the only way that we were allowed to be freed from that was to agree to sign a treaty in which we agreed to send all our children to schools that were set up by the churches and, and the US government. Um, and that's, that's my, my family history is that story. <laughs> Of, of that uh, disruption of, of our life, our way, our relationship to earth, our culture, but also um, what, we, what we held and did for, for all of the rest of the earth and humanity, and even I might add out into the cosmos. So that was a, it was a very large system <laughs> disruption, right? Um, and, and so my grandparents were taken into missionary boarding schools and then they sent my parents and they met there and, um, and then when I came along, there was um, people who were pr practicing our, our culture, our language, our spiritual way of life. And, um, and so I was, you know, I was presented with becoming an American girl from birth, basically. Um, so that's one way to talk about historical trauma, multi-generational. Um, I will say that, that I feel like I, I suffer from PTSD from those events, even though I never went to that boarding school. Um, you know, it's going to take, it's going to take several generations for that to wash out of the system, assuming that, you know, it doesn't continue, which of course it is continuing. So it's a slow process to, to move that out. But when I was inquiring outside today about what in the world should I say in terms of what is historical trauma, um, what came up right away was, you know, um, a lot of my work right now is looking at a very, very long view of, of history of earth and humanity. And I'm gonna say that um, historical trauma has been um, imposed upon humanity for, I don't know how long, maybe even as much as 200,000 years in, in, in one time frame that I might look at. And so, you know, to be honest, that's one way that I address my own trauma, historical trauma um, and current trauma uh, is I zoom out. <laughs> I zoom out. And, and actually, it's that skill set of being able to zoom out that I think is why I get asked to speak in so many different places, is to have to kind of provide a different overview. But as I look at us, um, hum humanity, you know, what I say a lot in my conversations about this is that, is that we are a traumatized species at this point. And it is multi-generational. And whether you've been on the side of, of perpetration, um, of oppression, or or um, violence, or whether you've been the, on the receiving end, um, it's, it's trauma because it's actually not a part of our, our, our way, our system. We're, we're built to be a part of uh, a unified, uh, well, as we say, a sacred hoop of life in which all, all life has a, has a way, you know, so ha, has, a, has a place. And so, um, so I think for me, Right now, that's a, that's a really big focus. I've spent a lot of years talking about the, the nuts and bolts of what happened in recent history, what's happened to my family, to my people. But right now, I'm, I'm really very interested in this concept of, of us as a traumatized species and, and how do we 
um, in, in this trauma that's gone on for generations, how do we even know what a non, who we could be as a non-traumatized being? <laughs> um, and so that's, that's actually a very big exploration of mine right now. So maybe I'll just leave it right there for the moment. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. Well, shall we um, go on to you, Bio? Okay. Okay, if you're ready. Yeah. Um, except Alicia wants to say something. Okay. Um, but, but I, am, okay. I will say that I am very much looking forward to hearing what Bio has to say. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, well, uh, yeah. Th thank you, Pat, for for saying that, especially the part about um, um, that we're traumatized as a species. Um, I think we don't say that often enough. That the very concept of being human is traumatizing. That there that there is violence in in the normativity of being human. Um, well, the standard definition of um, historical trauma is this, like, I get this picture of a, of a black hole, right? And the structure of a black hole is, it has this accretion disk where uh, stardust and fragments of other planets and star systems circulate just before being sucked into uh, potentially sucked into this void. Um, and uh, so historical trauma would be like something like uh, the accumulation of debris, right, of trauma um, over time, uh, and maybe caused by an event uh, felt by individuals and collectives. Um, it, but that standard definition doesn't quite speak to the themes that I want to speak to, the ideas and the juicy, tragic notions of non-individuality that I think I want to address. Um, because I, I think of historical trauma or generational trauma, psychologists speak about intergenerational trauma and how the very surprising and shocking notion that trauma can actually be shared across generations. Um, I like to speak about that as the lingering imperatives of ancestors and bodies that have not been met, that are especially um, heightened or charged and electrified when you see it through a modern perspective Modernity teaches us that time moves forward from past to present to future. But what we're learning through trauma, through our non-individuality, through our entanglement with bodies past and future, is that we are, that time doesn't move forward at all. Time is uh, slushy and messy and convoluted and mangled. And our ancestors are still present. That the present is thicker than than we've given it, uh, we, than we're able to notice uh, that the past is yet to come, if you will. Um, I was in Brazil um, just a couple of weeks ago, and I was uh, on a multi-week tour, speaking tour through Sao Paulo and Rio de Janeiro. Uh, Pat and I have had a be beautiful times in Sao Paulo. Um, I was taking through favelas, through artist collectives, speaking to many audiences across cities. Um, and I was taking to this place called Cais do Valongo, which is like a wharf, a pier. Um, it's a beautiful place. It's, it's, it looks very modern. It's good roads. It's this beautiful monument that has been erected over there a couple of decades ago. Um, and as I was walking, um, I, I got to this site, in this barricaded site, where the ground had been dug. You know, th there was, it had been excavated, and I saw pits of some kind. And I asked, what happened here? And they told me that in 2011 or so, a decade ago, um, 
they discovered hundreds of thousands of bodies buried there. Um, these were the slaves that were brought into Brazil and, and, were, and were not traded and were not sold and taken into the hinterlands. They remained at the border and they died there. And I think they estimated about 500,000 bodies squished together, um, uh, mangled and squeezed to make space for other bodies dumped there, just like a dumping site. And um, they opened it up and uh, they brought spiritual leaders, one of whom I met, um, to bless the place and to open up the place and to listen to what that place wanted. Um, and it was, such a, it was such a shocking event for me to just think about the dynamics of modernity and how it flattens, how it seeks to flatten and um, keep still the wilds, you know, to, to press down and tame the wilds, the lingering ancestral voices the voices of trees and stones and, and things that are strange, like the COVID-19 virus, to press it down and install and impose the imperatives of progress, the imperatives of um, survival. Um, and how that is being upset today, how that is being unsettled, how voices are springing forth. Um, what's an, another author calls blackness, Blackness being the wound that is opening up across the world, that is inviting us to descend, you know, into cracks. And I met lots of uh, Afro-Brazilians who had described their lives, not being able to make sense of what they wanted to do, not having questions to ask, having a sense of despair. Um, and being, of course, in a racially charged society, uh, the ones left behind. And part of the reason for that is that progress will not meet, flattening the world will not meet the imperatives of uh, the emotional, the lingering emotional imperatives of times that are supposedly done with. Um, so historical trauma, generational trauma, the emotional trauma that we share, that our bodies share beyond our intentions and our desires is, um, is this, it's this constellation of voices that we have been removed and divorced from that we need to listen to, that we need to know how to ritualize and meet and approach. That frankly, the, the systems and the, the justice imperatives and the algorithms and logic of modernity has no way, no understanding to, you know, to have no understanding of how to meet. Um, in its in its wildness, in its uh, feminine, in its feminine wildness. So I'll stop there for now. Mm. Wow, thank you, Baya. That was very um, nutritious. <laughs> Everything you said. Thank you, uh, Alesa. Thank you. I'm very much appreciative of Pat uh, mentioning and talking about how we are a traumatized species. Just to see that and recognize that opens up so much awakening to the tenderness that we could have with each other as humans that is not yet here but that is so much needed. I think of, I've been thinking too, what is historical trauma and how do I talk about it? Um, to me, it is very much the hurt and the wounding that has been so massive that one generation, often many generations, um, have not yet been able to hold it or to heal it. It's the overflow and it is so often what the children in any culture are left to carry, to carry forth. It's the extra, it's the, um, as, as Bio so wonderfully said, the past that is 
waiting that uh, that is calling to be known that is yet to to come and memory is um i think also so intricate and um is so much more than what we consciously remember it's what we carry in our bodies it's what we hold in our ways of knowing in our ways of being our ways of relating and historical trauma i think is especially the limits and the constraints and the closures in our ways of being and um i too wonder what what would our being and being a part of this earth and a part of this web of life with all beings what would it be like if we had healed much of this historical trauma it's um quite a leap to to find our way into that possibility um i also find that in in my work with people um and i i myself am uh from my parents are from pakistan and lived in india and their families lived there during british occupation and now here i am and my family is here in the us settled on this land that was first lived on and is lived on by indigenous peoples so i um i have an interesting stance in my own heritage and legacy and um i find that so much of historical trauma gets played out within cultures not just between them and so i came to wonder about these things thinking when i was younger how is it that people even within families um within communities can treat each other so brutally and the broader and broader it made my perspective i could see that there is so much being carried so much of that overflow and that cultures themselves are not homogenous they're not all the same and so within a culture the way that trauma ripples and reverberates affects the way that people then relate to those closest to them and that's often where we feel the most direct impact of the hurt um that's closest to us but that reaches into our personal lives from the depths of all history um and uh <clears throat> within within cultures we can look at who is who is the most convenient carrier of the trauma it may be in some cultures the children who have the least voice or who count for the least or it may be and or it may be women it may be persons who um are economically impacted and burdened and often that's um especially men too so um so much of the that reach from the past that has come between cultures and the massive collective wound wounding is then felt within cultures and i too am very much interested in how the the those experiencing the oppression as well as um when when we ourselves have been perpetrators or a, a word that i like to use that a friend of mine accidentally came upon when she was uh beginning to say the word perpetrator she said ended up saying perpetuator and i i rather like that word um we can all be perpetuators too and um so there is no place um in humanity in which we are apart from or separate from these legacies and so it it is up to us collectively to heal them as well um not as individuals um though though it comes to us felt as though um it's personal um it's so much more than that uh, i'll leave it there for now thank you so much oh, 
Thank you, Elisa. That's oh, wow. Uh, each one of you have just already just so many so many um, questions um, running through my being right now around this. And I think the thing that's that's most alive that uh, we can build on the next question um, is really you know on a I notice um, for myself. You know, I've, I've done a lot of healing of my own trauma, which as I agree with you, Bio, that we're all traumatized in one way or the other. And, um, and I've done a lot of, you know, a lot of healing on, on my own trauma. And, and yes, indeed, it is a place. It's like where fear is frozen in our nervous system. It's like, that's how it feels to me anyway. And that it takes a lot of intention and a lot of really, really in, uh, specific focused work to unfreeze that fear so it can be released and resolved and i i know that for me that i can't do that unless i feel safe in my environment because i can't have something continuing to tr trigger that trauma outside of me if i want to heal what's inside of me and so how i think of historical trauma is uh, or how why it plays into this conversation about between cultures is that those that are in communities that are still being oppressed marginalized or um, in some way they're, they're still in this collective trauma, that how can, uh, how, is it, how is it possible to, how, how much harder it is maybe to heal the personal trauma when you're still in an environment that isn't safe or, or has all this other collective stuff going on. So um, whoever would like to just to, jump on that and take it wherever um with just kind of popcorn here for any thoughts around your personal process around healing well um that was one thing that i was thinking about bringing up uh a minute ago too is to say that you know i've started saying this in the places that i speak um <clears throat> and that is to say that the reason that you like me to speak i mean i don't know not, ne not necessarily but maybe also you specifically but anybody is because i have been um enculturated <laughs> in a way through education systems, through all different systems that, that make me have the right mannerisms and the right uh, approaches to things um, that, that work with modern paradigm. So I'm indoctrinated into modern paradigm far enough <clears throat> so that I'm relatable. <laughs> so I'm starting to really want to point this out everywhere I go. <laughs> Because I want to say that, you know, you, you, a lot of times people want to hear from me because they're interested in, in what, what our culture has to say. And so this is something that I've noticed finally, um, I'm, maybe it's a little slow coming, but I feel like this is sort of my, my privilege, if you will, is that I come from, uh, I, have, I have access to, I should say, uh, a culture that is operating under a paradigm that is very different than modern world paradigm. And it's, um, it seems like it's just barely occurring in, to modern world paradigm to say, um, wow, maybe, uh, maybe this paradigm isn't working. And I feel like I have the luxury of being able to say, well, actually, I happen to know for a fact that human beings live in a, in a very different paradigm, even though we're sharing the same place and we share the same elements of fire, water, air, earth. Um, we, <clears throat> um, we're, we're living in the same place with the same set of circumstances. And yet how we interpret that and how we choose to interact with that and with each other is very different. And so I feel like this is, this is one reason why um, I get invited to, to speak in places is because I'm, I'm speaking from this foreign paradigm from this other place that humans live <laughs> in the same exact circumstances, but they think about things in a very different way. But, but there also is this aspect of me being able to express that in a certain way here that is relatable to, to modern world and to people who have been through the education systems and et cetera. But I often think 
um, about like my elders. Like I always wish it was my elders here sitting here talking with you. I mean, I really, really do. I always feel like, man, I am the least of my people. And <laughs> trust me on this. I really, I really am. Um, and yet, you know, it would be very difficult for, in some ways, for, for many of the people that I would love to have you speaking with to, to be able to cross that boundary and to be able to, to come into, into the space, you know. So, um, so on the one hand, um, my, you know, the, the program in the United States was called, you know, and the reason that these boarding schools were set up uh, the residential boarding schools was they said we want to make your own culture so repulsive to you that you will never return to it I mean that was that was the stated goal it wasn't a hidden agenda it wasn't in the back room of the CIA it was just right out front you know this is this is our goal to do this and <clears throat> and so in some ways I would say in my family that 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 was a success um, and uh, but not entirely so now we have this turn and this is true in many indigenous cultures that I, or any, or any culture really, that's, that's, slight, that's slightly out of modern world paradigm, um, you have this generational swing back towards, well, what, what do we hold that is different from modern world paradigm now? So I guess in terms of, of my safety, um, you know, this, this way of speaking, this way of thinking that can relate to academia, that can relate to scientific inquiry, that can relate to current economic paradigm, that, that is a part of my safety, <laughs> to be able to um, try to um, understand what, what, what happened, what, what was it that got interrupted, right? And, um, and at the same time, I, I feel, and especially right now I'm feeling this, I feel like this call to just abandon, abandon it all, <laughs> abandon all of that and, and to really spend that time into going into this place of inquiry into what was it that was interrupted. And interestingly, it's not just uh, about being Diné or Lakota. It has to do with, with like, again, this is a very old human history of asking who, who have we been? And, and here's this time thing. I agree with the time. Um, time is not what we think it is. That's what my spirit guides say to me all the time. Every chance they get, they're like, it, it, I know it looks that way from where you're sitting, but it's not what you think it is. And they have told me flat out, if all times are happening at the same time, what is possible? Um, but nevertheless, you know, I'm, I'm looking at, you know, so, so what, what is the potential of being um, as human being right now? And, and it's not, and, and for me, it's about, it's about moving out of um, my specifics in some ways, which is, which is a really hard place to stand in the middle of historical trauma in community. Because part of the way that we see to survive oftentimes is to, is, to, is to stay that much fiercer with our own culture and our own community and, and our ways and nobody else's ways. But I feel like there's a, there's a medicine and a safety in, in branching out and just inquiring about being human right now. Um, and, and I find that there is a safety in that. Um, you know, oftentimes I say to myself, I, I will be farmed for my trauma no more. That's one of my mantras to myself. I will be farmed for my trauma no more because I feel like this, this trauma wheel, or maybe, maybe it is part of the Dharma wheel, but this trauma wheel is so easy to perpetuate. It's, it's almost effortless. So in my cosmology, I hold this being called the trickster. And I always imagine the trickster just being able to give this trauma wheel just the slightest, you know, puff of breath and it just goes spinning. It takes nothing to keep it going. And it goes generation after generation. And I think, wow, if I wanted to dominate this place, that's what I would do. I would use um, trauma to keep this going and going and going. And I think that is exactly what has been happening for I don't know how long, again, it's been more than 5,000 years. It's been, I think, more than 100,000 years. Um, and so how does a fish understand that they are in water? How do we, how do we move out of that? Um, so for myself, uh, I guess I'll wrap with, with this, uh, is to say that I am starting to bring this to the audience's attention that, you know, what, I, what it takes for me to stand here and speak about these things has been quite a bit. <laughs> And it's not so much that I want to give myself a pat on the back, 
it's more that I just want to bring awareness to what it takes for somebody who has been through that journey of humanity recently to to stand up and then you know expound in a in a clear uh, hopefully concise and informing and hopefully uh, exciting way you know on these subjects but there's a whole host of people behind me who have a lot of thoughts and feelings about it that that, that can't be here in front of you and that's something I want to presence them for one thing but but also to know that for me it's it's double duty you know I'm I'm here with you and I'm thinking about it and I'm raising my head out of this water um, but at the same time um, when I when I get off this call, I am going to have to go work on some trauma <laughs> on some level, you know, I am to just be able to come back and meet the next call. So maybe that's not something that's on everybody's radar. But uh, anyway, hopefully that made some sense. I'm a little under the weather, but uh, doing my best here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pat. That... <sighs> Your words went right into my heart. So thank you. Bio or Alisa, yeah. you can go for it. Okay. Um, well, I will surely miss, Pat and I were supposed to have this string of events in Ireland, in the UK. Um, that's not gonna happen right now. Um, but I will, um, every time Pat speaks, I. I'm blessed, so so thank you for that, sister. Um, yeah, so I I I mentioned every time I get to speak, most times that I get to speak, that I was brought up in a very Christianized nation, and um, to be Christian in Nigeria is to be cut off from your stories, is to be is to be conditioned into a paradigm of righteousness and holiness that, that um, is premised on this very, very impoverished notion of independence um, and invites you to start all over again and, and dismiss all that has come before. I started to take this, I started to go on this decolonization journey way back and it meant me going underground, so to speak, to meet with Yoruba. Uh, I'm from the Yoruba people of West Africa and Nigeria, um, to meet with um, priests, healers, um, who spoke about the lingering powers of our gods and goddesses and Orishas. And it is through my relationship with them that I got to hear a very, very shocking story um, so the trauma of slavery is still, is still part of the architecture of our society. We don't speak about it much um, in Nigeria. We just have learned to, um, to make it invisible, which is unfortunate. And then going ahead as if nothing happened. As it, and for most of Nigeria, I would say, as if that's probably the best thing that could have happened to us. Like now we have schools and roads and gleaming towers. Now we have development, yay, GDP. Uh, but for a very small uh, section of uh, that society, there is the understanding that something was lost, irreparably damaged, and we need to know how to work with that. Um, so I heard this story about, because I started to ask questions. If our gods were so powerful, why did they allow, um, why did they allow those millions of bodies to be taken um, across the bite of Benin to the so-called new world, you know, over hundreds of years. Why did they allow that to happen? Uh, why didn't they, I mean, were they stopped by the power of the gun or the guinea men, you know, the, the slave ships? Uh, how powerful are they if they're stopped by those puny technologies? And then I heard this story about uh, a, a trickster, Pat was just speaking about tricksters right now. And the trickster called Eshu. And Eshu is uh, this primordial being who, who is like Shiva, the unsettler of everything. <laughs> the one who disciplines all boundaries and makes it such that entanglement is, 
is the crossroads of life, is, is the way bo bodies come to materialize. Um, and Eshu is said to have, uh, this god of war, Ogun, is said to have mounted up an insurgency against the slave masters and rushed to the border, you know, rushed the borders, you know, with all the other gods, trying to stop it from happening. Eshu met Ogun on the way to stop these things from happening. And he persuaded him to have a drink with him. And he gave him some very hot drink. I don't know whether it was vodka or maybe, I don't know, but it was really hot, some palm wine or something. And he persuaded Ogun to have this drink and, he, and Ogun went to sleep. So Ishu is said to have put to sleep the god of war and stopped the insurgency from happening and traveled with the slaves along with another beautiful goddess called Yemoja across the Atlantic or what was then called the Ethiopic Ocean before it was renamed the Atlantic Ocean. And um, I wondered why. And my people teach me that it's, it's because Eshu is walking, is, this trickster is working from a different notion of power. Not power as dominion over, but power as the betweenness of things. That even in that trauma, something, a gift was emerging. And the gift was the creolization of bodies, the difference making that makes the world happen. Um, the beautiful cultures that have emerged across the Atlantic as a result of this very, of course, um, terrible event. And so my people have taught me to look at trauma, not as something to be, uh, which is a difficult lesson to learn, something to be, to be done away with. And I, I wanna speak to this very briefly, this modern notion of healing, you know, as transcendence. There's this maybe subtle invitation that, you know, we can get outside the box, you know, how they say we should think outside the box. And I've said over time that thinking outside the box is exactly how boxes think. That this, 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 this notion to jump outside of it and come to a place of absolute wholeness where we are not, uh, where we're untainted, where we are pure, is exactly the kinds of imagination that our positioning, our conditioning, our embeddedness in modern paradigms instigates. So there, um, yeah, uh, I mean, I've been learning about viruses lately. I'm writing about the COVID virus and I, uh, I've learned about something called paleovirology, how viruses are not quite the enemies we think they are, how they actually our ancestors of ours, how they left part of their DNA in ours, so that if we look inside ourselves, we are part virus, part human. We are microbial too. We are, in fact, made by the trauma of that um, infestation of the colonization of viruses. So that to say that we can get rid of viruses is to perpetuate the myth of separation. Um, and so maybe there is maybe there is a place of noticing um, how modernization fetishizes trauma, how it says, this is a property, get rid of it, you know, dismantle it, um, you know, to repeat that Audre Lorde phrase, you know, the, the master's tool will not get, will not dismantle the master's house. Uh, but Karen Barad, one of my elders and friends would say in response to that, but the tools never stay faithful to the master for so long that even trauma is shifting, even trauma is changing, that in a relational universe, trauma is, is fluid and moving, and that maybe the rituals that we are being invited to be in now is, is not the very modern notion of getting rid of stuff, but in eating it more, and maybe cannibalizing the trauma, in eating it and staying with the trouble is what Donna Harry would say. And, and maybe in that moment of eating it, of sharing it, of disturbing its right to exclusivity, its claim to exclusivity, then something different happens, like issue traveling with the slaves. Difference happens. Transformation happens. Um, yeah. I don't realize that I may take too much time, so there you go. Thank you. That was really inspiring. Alesa, would you like to to jump on that or? I'm thinking about 
Learning about trauma, reading about trauma from a Western perspective thought, well, safety is so important. We need safety first because otherwise people will be overwhelmed. And I have um, find in in my therapeutic work with people and exploring in myself and in my I've come to find that for for some people the idea of safety is a nice Western uh, golden treasure to be found, and I I think more now what, what's safety? What is safety? Is it the idea that one can be guaranteed not to be harmed or hurt? I don't see safety anywhere to be found on Earth, um, and I think we can have temporary comfort. I think there is love. I think there's tenderness. I think there is being with. I don't see safety, though. Um, And it may be that the very quest for some kind of safety, safety from what's in our own minds, has driven so much of the traumatization um, that gets perpetuated. Um, I, For example could think of uh, people who I've spoken with, who I know, who for generations have not known safety. So if I speak to them of um, what would make you feel safe, well, that's quite an unfamiliar idea. And so perhaps shifting our gaze to to something that... um, and by what you said makes me think of this too, that to metabolize the trauma, to be with the trauma, to be in the trouble of it, um, is much more consonant with um, the way that the historical trauma touches us all, reverberates through us all in different ways. And the, the idea of safety uh, to build on what you said, Bio, it feels like it's that outside of the box place that people might imagine. Um, but really, I think what we can sometimes have and sometimes need is some some rest, some temporary comfort, some respite to find what matters to us, what we value, to try to live that way um, for love, for tenderness, for connection, for being with, for being in the world, um, and and for being gentle with ourselves when it is too much for us to know what to do or how to be in the moment. That's okay. Um, but if anybody finds this safety, um, please please let me know where it is. Um, I will pass it on, uh, pass it back to you, Jewel. Thank you. Oh boy. This is so, um, this is so rich and, uh, and actually it's a really good kind of segue into, you know, the next, the second part of our, our questioning, which is really, how do we, I mean, we've already been talking about how, how do we, how do we heal? And, and so, uh, and specifically, you know, communities, you know, because we're talking about, you know, historical trauma and communities that have had that and the different communities that have different, you know, like the oppressor oppressed community, for instance. And I, and I'm realizing now after hearing all you speak that, you know, it's, it's really important not to, to, um, to, I don't know, characterize or generalize in, in any way. It's, it's important to really just go deeper into the conversation and not get caught into ideas about things and traumas and things like that. So that's what I'm, I'm kind of picking up from when I'm hearing. And I really appreciate that. But how, but you know, the way we, we communicate and collaborate across cultures, um, different community, cultural communities. I um, mean, obviously it's something that we, we need to be doing and, you know, cause we're, we're all in this together. So in light of all this, what, what are ways that, that we can heal together? What are ways that we can begin to focus on the healing and not focus on the trauma? You know, bringing that in.
whoever would like to jump in. Yeah, I could go, Ta, with your, okay, and Alisa, with your permission. Um, well, ju just to say something else as well, that, uh, and I think it also speaks to the question from a, from, from an oblique, you know, angle. Um, I also want to notice that, that trauma is not even uh, uh, an exclusively human issue. Um, it, it's it's not a human property. It's it, it you know how they say cows eat grass and produce methane, and and how biologists with uh, with uh, deeper tools have been able to notice that it's not actually the cow that produces methane. It's this the cow just eats grass. And it's this microbial community in its gut that does the work of producing methane. Um, and so that a cow is not really a cow, if you understand what I'm saying. A cow is a composite creature all the way down. It's, uh, it's a constellation of bodies. It's an ecosystem. Um, in the same way, we are not individuals. We are, we are composite. We are constellations. We are we are amalgamations, what this French philosopher Deleuze will call agents more, an assemblage of, of the many, of the manifold. So that trauma is this thing that is held between fragile, vulnerable, um, not just a, a, a coherent thing that is just there, like a property or category. It's also shifting and changing and taking on new shapes. Um, uh, having said that, um, the thinking about how we deal with trauma, how we meet trauma in its monstrosity, in its shape-shifting monstrosity, is something that has activated my work in the Emergence Network and my writing for some time. The work that I've been doing, uh, the work that I was invited to do in Brazil called Vunja is, is about meeting trauma not by escaping, not by leveling the roads, but by descent, going to the place of cracks and building sanctuary, what I've called sanctuary together. And sanctuary is this idea of sharing, um, not in a human centered way, but decentering the human in our sharing uh, and being together in conversation and ritual and ceremony that allows the missing, the invisibilized ones ancestors, microbial worlds, to be centered, to come in, if you will. I, I can speak at length about that, but the time will not be enough. Um, and so what was the question again, Jewel? I think I've traced it. Um, uh, what are some ways that we can heal between communities right. that, that have traditionally been yes. in conflict? Now I remember what I wanted to say. <laughs> the, I, I wrote, uh, um, very generously about the word nigger in, in my book, These Wilds Beyond Our Fences, and about uh, how I'm not an African-American, I'm African. Um, and so I had to learn about the racial dynamics in, that, in the United States. Um, and I've been learning about that over time. And I remember watching this episode of a talk show where this rapper, Ice Cube, was berating uh, Bill Maher, I think his name is Bill Maher, for using the word and saying basically, you don't use this word ever. It's a line you never cross, that you have no right to use this word. The N word, I think it's called. And, and I wrote about how that, um, uh, my sister Alisa just spoke about safety now. And Alisa, I would look for safety. If I find safety, I would let you know, but I doubt that we would come across it anytime soon. But this, this invitation you know, to, to this grid formation that is produced by, um, inadvertently by intersectional uh, politics and, and even though it's a beautiful thing, identity politics um, seems to reiterate and keep in store the trauma that we're trying to release. Um, Ice Cube was speaking about the line you never cross. 
what he may not have noticed is how that line that you never cross, no matter the context, uh, non-black people are not supposed to cross, is also the line that keeps us in. It's also the line that keeps us caged in, in prison and incarcerated. And so the trauma doesn't have anywhere to go. It has nowhere to dance. And so I've been writing about intersectional theory. Uh, Crenshaw was the one that created intersectional theory. And I don't know if it was our intention, but right now that theory, which informs representational politics in the United States, um, has instead created grids, more grids, more categories that victimizes and stabilizes the trauma instead of releasing it. So I'd like to speak instead about Aje, which is the relational dynamics and paradigm of the Yoruba people. Um, Aje is what Christian missionaries named as witchcraft when they came, which was unfortunate. Um, but Aje speaks about more than identity. It speaks about how identity is a gift and how identity is always partial, always negotiated, always moving. Uh, the identity politics that is found in the United States today, as, is, as much as it wants to do the work of justice, is, part of the cre is a creature of, modern, of the modern paradigm. It, it, it seeks to create a safe space where trauma can live, but it doesn't, have, it doesn't know what to do with how trauma can live on or pass by. And so um, I speak about Ajay and, and, and the and itokonle and all these Yoruba concepts that are invitations to radical hospitality, to release like a manumission, uh, to release the trauma by staying with it and not by fetishizing it. Um, I might say something else about that for now, but let me just leave this bit alone. Thank you, wow. Um, Pat or Alisa, would you'll move to, to add to that or talk about um, just your thoughts on healing, how we, how we can heal together. This is Alisa, she'll move to enjoy that. <laughs> what what bias and, and to celebrate it. Um, yes, indeed. Mm -hmm. Um, <clears throat> well, I think um, right now with this coronavirus business, we're getting a good look at how to work across communities. <laughs> we're getting the crash course. <laughs> and, um, and I'm really excited about that part of everything. Um, I, I was saying, uh, you know, you have to appreciate the genius of this arising right now. Uh, it's, it's absolute genius. <laughs> it's bringing to the fore everything that has to be brought to the fore. It's bringing all the conversations, but in a very different way. Um, because it's, it's sort of not hypothetical. I mean, I don't know. Uh, it's, it, uh, anyway, so I'm just marveling at that. And, and I'm feeling like it's uh, it's it's gonna it's a huge teacher, and I and I have this sense. So I was asking myself. So when I say genius, like who's genius? What's genius? You know, and and I think it's I really I, I first I started out by saying I think it's the Earth's genius, and maybe it's spirit's genius, maybe it's but I really think it's a combination of all of us together, um, kind of having a an uh, maybe an unvoiced cry of some kind <laughs> from all directions. Um, and this was the answer in some strange way. Um, so, so I'm looking at that. Um, and, and this is kind of how I've been thinking about it lately, because I feel like uh, I, I don't sit in on a lot of um, social justice meetings lately. Um, it's, it's really difficult for me. I feel like what, what I really believe and what I really feel and what I really think is not particularly welcome in those spaces. <laughs> but I'm going to try it out here a little bit. Um, and see what happens. Uh, I feel like the Mother Earth just, you know, she, she can't be bothered with our justice right now. She really can't. She's like, you know, I don't know what all that is about over there, but, um, but what I notice is, so, so I have to draw this illustration of the sacred hoop of life, right? And so from that perspective, every single life form gets to have a, a seat on this sacred hoop. 
and every single so this is you know animal mineral plant everybody you know gets to have this seat and each one has a perfect design to uphold their part of this hoop and as long as they uphold their part then the hoop remains uh, very stable and and generative it's not it's not in you know it's not in a, at a standstill it's it's generative it's 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 constantly creative um all these infinite possibilities of life are are inspiring each other to do all these different things um but i have this idea that you know the idea about this hoop is that everybody is is operating with the idea that thriving life is is the whole plan like we're all agreed that thriving life is the plan now in this in this in this scenario every single being has to uphold their part and if somebody doesn't uphold their part then the integrity of the whole begins to falter um or maybe i will at this point we'll say it's a cry out for for a different something different um and so so i feel like you know the human five-fingered part of this hoop is not being upheld um we we got distracted and and we got distracted by our own selves i think and i also think we got distracted by trickster um hugely um and and so i feel like we're not upholding our part of this sacred hoop right now and so the integrity of the hoop and the whole is beginning to fail so for me when i think about that i think mother earth is looking at this section of the hoop that belongs to the five fingered ones and she's noticing that we're very distracted and not doing our part so that's i think that's a really big underlying question for me that helps release my trauma is to ask well what is that function what is that function of the five fingered ones that is perfect i mean it's perfect it, it and it knows how to contribute to this fantastic symphony of of interbeing and interbeingness with all these different you know from from microbes to to stones to waves to uh stars um you know and yet there is a perfect um melody that humanity plays in this in this orchestra in this symphony but but we but we don't know we, we we've lost our way in remembering what that is so when i think she looks at our part of the hoop and says wow that part is definitely fallen she's not looking at whether that we're ku klux klan or um Dene or or trans or you know like she's just looking at the five finger part of the hoop and going all you guys over there you're not doing it <laughs> and so in that sense i really have this feeling of her you know she she can't really be bothered with our with our just social justice issues at this moment right now she's looking at okay so how do we how do we put this back into a homeostasis for everything and everybody and i don't feel like she has a vindictiveness or a vengefulness or she's not a punitive being she's 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 on her course she's on her mission um which is which is to be this co-creative gener generating um thriving life um multi being entity uh and so i i i at this point you know i I've, i've said and actually i know that somebody was in a course of bios i believe and and reported that i had said this <laughs> and and my understanding was that there was an objection a big objection in that course so that's how i know it's a little bit risky to say um and especially in in this context but but i for myself i say you know i would give up all my justice i have a hell of a lot of justice do me i mean i have big justice do me i'm i'm female <laughs> so right away i have like huge justice do me i'm brown um i'm i'm dene uh I'm native of what we now call the United States. I mean, I got all kinds of justice to me. But I'm willing to say and I'm not asking anybody else to do this, but I'm willing to say I would give it all up. I would give it all up if we could all then turn and ask the mother earth, what is it that you ask of us right now? Like what what is that? And so in a sense, I feel like this 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 virus that's come around is is sort of is sort of asking that question. You know, we we're, we're being forced to ask, well, wait a minute, what is it that you need of us right now? So we're being forced to some of us to learn very basic uh biology and um and human systems that we did not know before because 
you know, everything is so whatever and has been for a while education wise that, that we don't have, know the basics of these things. And so we're being, and we're, and we're like, oh, wow. Well, it's not just that um, when I take all the toilet paper, there's, there's, uh, there's enough for me, you know, it's like, what about the elders? What about, so all of a sudden our interconnectedness is being, you know, brought to bear and all these systems. So, um, so in a sense, I feel like our social justice teaching is, is going to arise um, with one event after another at this point. Um, I mean, I, I don't want to, I know for some people this this virus is is really really frightening but I just feel like we are we are up for some massive changes because we have to because because our part of the hoop you know we've just been out to lunch um so I mean that's that's a way over simplification but but in, in for what for lots of reasons we have not been attending to the business at hand and and so um at that point I just that's why I have to go into this place of feeling like um, what does it mean to be a human being? How do I uphold the honor of being human being? What does that really mean? And, you know, for a, uh, for a lot of the social justice issues right now, I feel like there's so much um, attention being put on trying to be equal, trying to have equal access in a dying, failing, collapsing system. And I understand the impulse because to, to have not been recognized as even being human or to be honored or to be held in any way within that system is painful. It was very, very, very painful for ancestors and et cetera. And at the same time to be clamoring to fight for a better seat on the Titanic, um, you know, we, we, we're gonna have to, at least in these conversations, include the fact that that is also present. If not, turn our attention entirely to this. We have to at least acknowledge that it is there, and I don't see that happening in social justice conversations right now. I feel like like there's a very big, um, you know, I, I forget how you said it. You said it so beautifully, Bio. But this this cultural identity piece that is imprisoning us and also muting us because nobody can say it right. As soon as you try to say anything, you get you get called out. The call out culture. Oh, you can't say that. Oh, you don't, you know, and so everybody's just being silenced at a time when we really need to be coming together. So I'll stop there. Hmm. Wow. Thank you, Pat. Um, I am deeply grateful for your sharing all that. And uh, I, I, I feel no, no resistance at all whatsoever to, <laughs> to your message that is, um, it, it feels really timely. And, um, in, and it is what we are as transition um, in general, we, we are advocating for, for system change in general, just so you know, it's not, you know, trying, we're trying to get off the Titanic. <laughs> so, so um, yeah, so, so we are in, within that context. Um, as, so I totally um, love everything you said and we'll be chewing on it for quite some time i think and everything that's been said so thank you um elisa do you would you like to uh jump in there sure thanks so rich um i have i find so often i found in myself too the wish to open a book or find someone to tell me how to do this right what to say what not to say and what i'm what i'm uh, really sitting with right now is the importance of when we're uh, we're all being together between different cultures or being with others um who we don't yet know so well um to, that i hope that we can open our eyes and look at the faces of each other. And, and um, I am stretching a little bit to say that for myself because um, uh, I, by the way, am mostly blind or at least I'm almost there yet. I've been working on it for a few years. I'm not quite there yet, but almost. But um, I, I in, in any case, in whatever way we see and hear and know each other, I think that's the way to um, to to be together 
and find and discover what's possible in finding our best selves and learning how to trust what's in us and not in some book or something that someone will tell us or some formula we can find for how to go about relating in this world and with all beings. And I, I really appreciate um, what you have said here, Pat, that perhaps if we can keep our eyes open and seeing each other and not focused on whether we are right or not, we can see Mother Earth and we can hear those calls and we can really hear what's uh, what's called on from us and trust and find in ourselves the response that that can be there, that is there. Um, if it's not cluttered up and crowded out by um, all the concerns about um, what if I what if I make a mistake. Um, so that's that's all that comes to me right now. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Elisa. Yeah. Um, one other thought that that uh, want to just chime in there about this idea of social justice too is is that I think it feels like what we're doing here more is about it. It may be that social justice isn't the right term. It's more about dis. It's, it's more about healing or or shifting or dismantling whatever word you want uh, to use for changing our thought system and how we see each other and how we uh, sit together so that I feel like that's what this work is it's like how do we how do we open our minds a little shift a little in the in a better direction little by little um, um, and I'll just add that that maybe it's about um, expanding um, each from our own place. Um, what is the context that all this is happening in, really, both in time and culture and place? Um, because it's it's a it's a much more complex context than than um, than universities who tried to talk about this with me. Seem to be able to express. So when we meet like this, then then we begin to expand on on context quite a bit. Mm. Yeah. Can, can, can I can I add to that? And you know, Sam, I'm so I'm so grateful the concept of social justice has come up. Um, that that it 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 seems to be the case. And I like the question you asked, Pat. That would I want an equal seat on the Titanic at this time? I've been asking the question about would I want an equal piece of a carcinogenic pie? And, <laughs> and, and now the, 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 the genius, as you call it, of this, of this virus, which is not a thing, is it's a whole network of relationships and practices. Um, the genius of it is that it's, it's showing us that maybe the script needs to be retired or composted. The script of how we meet each other, the script of how we expect or imagine justice and maybe justice gets in the way of transformation maybe the very notion of justice gets in the way of transformation and and so just using this moment to respond to my brother's uh, question here elaine says that getting rid of the viruses or trauma perpetrates the myth of separation that i should expand on the alternative and brother i don't know the alternative um i don't know what comes next and i don't pretend to um, but that's the gift of this time. The Confucian is generative. Um, I like to tell people that Confucian literally means mingling together. And there's work to be done there. Uh, when we meet each other in the not knowingness of this time is to sit with each other, to, to hold space for each other, to feed each other, to be fed by each other, um, to eat together. The kinds of celebratory, carnivalesque, you know, rituals that could emerge at this time you know, are, are things that we can expect or that we can look forward to without rushing into another kind of solutionism that prescribes exactly what should come next or that invites us to create a new manifesto for the new kinds of society that we will arrive at. Um, I don't know. And my people have not had the luxury of thinking about the future as if, it, as if it's a stable thing for a long time. 
we've dwelt in the not knowingness of things, in uncertainty and confusion. And maybe the invitation at this time, just in the way that cracks um, are openings with which uh, viruses find their, uh, their passage into our bodies, maybe they're mimicking the kinds of, you know, the kinds of adventures we should take as well. That let's go beneath the foil of whiteness, beneath the foil of uh, justice, uh, the, the stabilizing flatness of modernity. Let's go into wherever we find cracks. Uh, decolonization is not our work, as in, in, the, in the sense that it's primarily humans that are the drivers of change. We need to sit with the space or in the space where we're decentered, where we're not the drivers of change. And notice that maybe the work of our time is to have things done to us, is to be met by things greater than us. And maybe then we'll know what we want, how to imagine, what we should do, how to speak, what we can, uh, how we can greet each other. So uh, um, I, I don't know the answer to that question of what is the alternative to getting rid of viruses. I do know that um, the, uh, it, it, trying to get rid of viruses or trauma or whatever lingers or monster, whatever monster lingers at the edges of our fences sometimes perpetuates the trauma, sometimes and oftentimes reiterates the problems that we're trying to get away from. So escape doesn't cut it anymore. There's no getting out of this. We need to sit with it. No vaccine will solve modernity's problem. We need to sit with ourselves and sit with the trauma. Whew. Wow. I, I know that I'm going to be sitting with that, everything you, you just said and, and everything that's been said and very, very potent. I feel like we have, um, I, I feel a healing happening right here and now, just in, in coming to this place. It uh, uh, looks like one, one person, John, wrote, it's okay to be with not knowing and, and not knowing, just sitting together in that uncertainty um, and, and not needing to, to, to fix anything, but, but seeing each other and being together and having these conversations and allowing ourselves to be changed by each other is maybe that's that's the healing um i hope everybody that's been listening in has received as deep and rich of a healing as i i have in this conversation um we are at uh the stated end time um of this call I'm wondering if we could take just a minute or two just to have a closing with each uh, speaker to say something. And also, um, I just want to let the people listening in know that next week, um, Galen and uh, Alisa and myself will be holding a dialogue, a healing dialogue, so that people can have a place to come and talk about all this and ask questions. Um, we're not going to just leave it here. <laughs> we want to continue conversations like this. Um, so just so you know that that's there. Um, would um, you have any closing uh, remarks or thoughts or anything? Um, I'd just like to say that uh, I so appreciate um, being on this uh, panel with each of you. And at the same time, I, I do want to point out that I feel like we represent a, a, a very far part of a spectrum of culture and people who are trying to address this. And um, and it's, it's a difficult thing then to come away from this conversation and then walk right into a community, say of Diné, and, and try to talk to them about what I personally have said. Um, it might not go that well, frankly, um, because everybody's in a different place. So I just want to remind people of that. But also, I just want to say that, um, uh, you know, I, as Bio was talking, I, I keep thinking of this thing. Uh, and that is that when I was being faced with something in a, in a spiritual difficulty, you know, my guide came to me and said, whatever comes our way, we will use for our purpose if you stay close to me. And, um, and our purpose being thriving life paradigm. Um, and so that's how I feel um, about everything that arises right now. There is a way to make it into medicine. And I think that's a big part of what we're trying to learn together. So thank you. Thanks, everybody, for being here. Thank you. 
Yeah, Lisa, you, you can you can go. Mm -hmm. I I'm still processing what I think I was going to say. <laughs> mm hmm. Well, I wish I knew what to say. I do feel um, very much appreciation for all of you um, sisters, brothers, fellow human beings, all the unknowns in in all of us um, and in all beings and. Um, I welcome um, whatever all the the rest of this that will um, that I as I continue to process it too. Um, anyway, I, I'm appreciative of all of you joining us today. And Bio and Pat, thank you so much. It's been such a joy to and um, an honor to be able to talk with you both, alongside you both about these matters. Um, Thank you so much. Okay, thank you, sister. Uh, I guess my my um, uh, my own final words are are also about gratitude. Gratitude to you know to everyone for being here and to Jewel for inviting me and for Pat and Elisa for speaking courageously and uh, with such palpable wisdom. I've learned from all of you um, and to everyone else, you know, everyone who is part of this call and people who would listen to this in these very thick and curdling times, um, I would say that there, the invitation to slow down is not just a function of speed, of reducing one's speed, but literally noticing, learning to notice, allowing ourselves to be worked on so that we notice the richness, the vibrancy, the animacy of the world around us. So not just social distancing, making sanctuary, not just isolating yourself in a place. Um, the work is also of making sanctuary together. And just to remind us, the paradigm, the practice, the middle age practice of making sanctuary had people holding onto gargoyles, the doors of, um, of churches and buildings and temples and claiming sanctuary. And I think that's a figure for what we need to do today, to, to not run away from the monster, but to think that sanctuary is actually protected by the monster. And so that's where we need to go, to, to go to the place where it's most difficult, the ugly, and dwell there, because that's where the wealth is. Thank you. Thank you, totally agree. Thank you, everybody, um, Pat and Bio and Lisa, just so much gratitude to you three for sharing your hearts and minds on the subject and uh, your presence. And thank you to everybody that has, uh, has been listening in and everybody that will listen in in the future to the recording. Um, we're all in this together and let's keep the conversation going. Look forward to next week's dialogue, um, same time. And then next month, uh, we'll be talking about the nature of privilege and bio, uh, you'll be joining us for that as well, I believe, um, or we'll, we'll confirm that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes. And um, yes, and I also love to invite you back, Pat, anytime you would be most welcome. So, and Elisa for future conversations. So thank you all. And uh, thank you, Galen, and all those behind the scenes for helping make this happen. Um, blessings. Sorry, we didn't have time for questions. <laughs> I didn't, it was a very full, full conversation. Thank so. you. Take care, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Bye. 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 Bye.